In keeping with the theme of missing people in the Great Smoky Mountains, I wanted to cover another story that I found um, that's a little more recent. Michael Heron, H-E-A-R-O-N. There are even more strange disappearances that are even more recent than that of Dennis Martin and Polly Melton. In 2008, 51-year-old Michael Heron went out in his four-wheel drive truck. He was supposed to go to some land located near their home in Blount County, Tennessee, that is actually part of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. After he didn't come home when he said he would, a search was organized and conducted. Dogs brought, the dogs were brought in for the search, could find no scent of him and authorities never found any bits of torn clothing, no splatters of blood, tissue, bones. There were simply no signs that he had been there. There were no signs of a struggle. Nothing seemed unusual other than his truck that it seemed as though he just ceased to exist. A following search of hundreds of volunteers and police officers turned up nothing. A heavy storm and rainfall moved in and threatened to destroy any evidence that there could have been. Finished in the mountains, Michael Heron's disappearance still haunts the area a decade later. Happy Valley, Tennessee. Michael Edwin Heron vanished on August 23, 2008. Despite efforts from Blount, Blount County Sheriff's Department, the Happy Valley community, Webb Sluice, and close friends and family members, Michael has never been located. One of nearly 200 people who seemingly vanished in East Tennessee. And they have a list here that you can read about. Mike is a father of two. He, was, he is a beloved builder with the Blount County community and a trail cutter for the National Park. According to his sons, Matt and Andy, he was a joy to be around. He was a real fun guy. He was not boring at all. He was always really friendly to everyone, and a lot of people spoke very highly of him. Mike had two homes. During the week, he stayed at his property in Maryville, and on the weekends, he lived at his generational home in Happy Valley. On Saturday, August the 23rd, Mike called his son Matt and told him that he was going to head up to the mountain for the weekend, nothing out of the ordinary. He left me a message, and I didn't think anything about it. Andy saw his dad the day he vanished. He said Mike planned to mow the Happy Valley property over the weekend. He came by my house to pick up a lawnmower. I actually passed him in the car, pulling on to 321. So basically what his son, his son said is that he stopped by his home to pick up a lawnmower, but the son was in his truck leaving, and as the father turned off of the highway to go onto his property, the son just kept driving because he knew that his dad was just coming by to pick up a lawnmower, and then he was going to leave. Mike's sons didn't hear anything from their dad all weekend. By Monday, the silence raised suspicion. They both worked with their dad through the week building homes. Usually we were talking to him in the morning to find out what our day was going to be like, what jobs we had to do. They called their grandmother, Mike's mother, who said she had not heard from him either. That's when the two sons decided to go to the Happy Valley home. I was starting to get worried as we were driving up there because the whole fact that we were having to go look for him was very odd. We've never been in that situation before because we would always know where he was. They searched the property. They noticed that his truck was still at the house. It was unlocked. The windows were down, and his wallet and keys rested on the dash. Um... That was really odd. If he planned to go camping or leave for the day, he definitely would have had his car keys. His, his truck would have been locked up. They ventured inside the home and found nothing out of place. The doors were unlocked. Both sons said that, was not, that that wasn't out of the ordinary. All of his valuables were still inside. He had taken no clothes and nothing seemed to be missing. 
Then the sons realized an ATV was missing from the property. They called the Blount County Sheriff's Office. That was the first call. Then immediately the Sheriff's Department met us over at his house, which is where his truck was. Within an hour, the deputies arrived at the scene and it started to rain. We were called out to his house at night and I remember it was raining. That was challenging as rain can wash away evidence. It rained for several days after that, but despite the weather conditions, BCSO, Blount County Sheriff's Office, came out the next day to start a search. Community members joined in and everyone wanted to find the four-wheeler. Investigators thought if they can find the ATV, they would find Mike. We got everyone together Tuesday morning very early and that's when we started doing the grid searches. It was around lunchtime when we found the four-wheeler. However, it was a normal situation. It was placed really odd. We didn't really find a whole lot of evidence, just some tracks. The ATV was parked on the hill sideways down a road which Mike would never have traveled. The ATV had the keys in the ignition and the kill switch was off. We grew up on four-wheelers and dirt bikes. When you turn something off that has an ignition switch and a key, you turn the key off or you'll drain the battery. Our dad never would have left that turned on. Since the discovery of the ATV, there have really been no leads. It would be definitely considered a cold case. My mind has gone a hundred different ways. Your mind is just all over the place, and you think of all these different scenarios and ideas, and you come up with so many different questions, said his son Andy. The detective with the police department said he is always looking for new leads in this case. We get tips and we follow up on them. We've gotten tips up until like a few months ago, and any time we get a tip, we will go out and follow up on it. But most of those have led to nothing but dead ends. It has been 14 years, and now they just want someone to come forward with some information so they can get closure. There's no way he would stay away from his family this long. The sons don't believe their father is alive, and they said their goodbyes years ago. He has been declared legally dead. Um, if you have any information that could lead to the location or what may have happened to this man, please call the Blount County Sheriff's Office. Thirteen years after this mysterious disappearance, the popular true crime podcast, Park Predators, is shining a spotlight on the case of Michael Heron. 51-year-old Maryville, Tennessee man vanished into thin air one weekend in August of 2008. While working on his family's land, which borders the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, he was spotted again by two other neighbors on an ATV. He waved at them. They thought nothing of it, waved back, but he was never seen again. The four-wheeler was found a few days later, but not so much as a footprint was left behind. No pieces of torn clothing, no blood, or nothing like that. Nothing discovered has ever led to find out what may have led to his departure. It's just so strange. It had some other elements beyond the standard missing aspect. Um... Matt Heron helps illustrate what happened the weekend his dad disappeared from inconsistencies that don't add up to twists and turns in the investigation. We're talking about something sort of spooky, he said, but there's this whole human story that goes with it. Matt and Andy married their spouses soon before their father went missing. They've maintained that Michael would, ha would not have voluntarily abandoned his family. The two brothers have become fathers themselves since their dad disappeared. Through the years, the family had to come to terms with the possibility that Heron could be dead, so they stopped hosting Hike for Mike, an annual hike to keep their father's case from going cold. They tell their sons about their, about their grandpa Mike, 
it's just kind of a cloud that we're just really living under, not really knowing how to, to get through what happened. We know that whatever happened to our dad was not good. This was a property that was like a, a hundred acres that bordered the, the Smoky Mountains National Park. Could it be that he came upon something, just like I said in, in earlier, he, with a child, you, you assume a predator of some sort, such as a human predator, like a, a child abductor, could it be that he came upon someone or someone was at his home when he got there? Police and the searchers say they never found any signs of any kind of a struggle. I don't know. Uh, it, it is strange. There's not much new to report in this case. A lot of rumors and theories. No significant leads have come forward. I hope that the people from that area, the people that knew him or knew of his family, think back to that day and try to remember if they may have seen him or had conversations or if they remember seeing any people around there that were out of place. But now that close to the Smoky Mountains, it wouldn't be unusual to see people hiking. Some people may venture off of the trail and, you know, I hope that people keep their eyes open. And if you find anything that seems out of place, contact the Blount County Sheriff's Office at 865-273-5200. Um, I had a kind of a somewhat, I don't want to say a rude comment, I guess that it was a suggestive, constructive, critical comment. Um, uh, I'm hoping that the person intended it to be constructive criticism. They said that they couldn't really finish my uh, video, one of my videos, because I was unprepared and unprofessional and that may be true but I click these links and I read to you all the listener as I'm reading it for the first time so sometimes it takes a minute or two for a page to open and I often interject my own thoughts into it um, if it comes across as unprofessional maybe it is because I'm not a professional podcaster or a professional videographer. I'm just here to talk and to tell you all about these stories and I read them aloud as I'm reading them. So I hope that, you know, it comes across as just a down-to-earth conversation like you might have with someone, you know. So this one just says, uh, this is the Strange Outdoors Mysteries. Um, the last time Mike was ever seen was August 23, 2008. He was last seen on his ATV four-wheeler by some neighbors as he was driving around his 100-acre home. The area lies adjacent to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. No footprints or anything obvious was ever found. Um, the undergrowth, what they're saying is like the undergrowth and the brush was undisturbed. So it didn't look like anybody had moved. If you picture going into the woods, into a shrubbery, um, underbrush, of overgrowth of like briars and stuff, you're going to move that stuff away. You're going to, you know, uh, and if you're like this man probably was, familiar with the area, you're going to know what areas are overgrown. And you're going to, if you're going to go out into the woods, you're probably going to pick a trail that's already cut through, you know. And that's what they're saying here. There was nothing like that to show that he had, you know, cut any brush or anything out of the way. Um... Mike was five foot ten and he weighed around one hundred and eighty five pounds. He was wearing a faded red t shirt with khaki cargo shorts and sandals on the day of his disappearance. 
Now, this was according to the neighbors who saw, saw that they saw him on the four-wheeler. So this is what they described him as having on. He has a scar on the back of his knee from a surgery and a scar on his leg between his knee and thigh. Um, he has an appendectomy scar on his stomach and a tattoo on his lower back. Okay, this is a strange and unusual thing, but one of his feet was one and a half sizes smaller than the other. He has capped teeth and a snake bite scar on his foot. Mike was fit and healthy, but he did have a mild high blood pressure. But if he had suffered from any kind of health issue, he probably would have tried to ride his four-wheeler back to his home to make a phone call. I don't think that they're trying to insinuate that he might have suffered any kind of problems from high blood pressure. He was born in East Tennessee and went to Lanier High School where he played football. After high school, he worked for the Park Service trimming trails. So see, he knew where these trails were and he would have known how to go about cutting trails. And nothing was out of the ordinary. There was, there was no new fresh cuts or anything made to any of the shrubbery or the underbrush on the property. And that was what he did for a living, so he would have known where to cut and where not to cut, you know. Um... He started a business as a third generation home builder and had a successful building business, Michael Heron Builders. His sons Matt and Andy contracted with the business. The business had sold a lot of its housing inventory in 2007 before the housing crash. There was no signs that Michael was suffering any kind of financial distress. So no one thinks that he may have faked his own death or um, disappeared with a large sum of money, you know, to avoid a, a bank payoff. Or, you know what I'm getting at? They're not, they, they don't believe that he had any kind of financial issues that would have led him to try to, you know, escape from that. He knew the area very well and the 100-acre farm with cattle that he owned. He would often explore caves and go deep into the Great Smoky Mountains. Mike's neighbors, who lived next to his property near the end of Bell Branch Road, saw him pull into his driveway when he was hauling a piece of equipment on a trailer. This was probably the riding lawnmower or the ATV. Thirty minutes later, the neighbors saw Mike on his ATV and said he waved at them as he drove down the road. Their grandmother Alma told Matt and Andy that earlier that morning that she and Mike's dad had walked about five minutes from their house on Happy Valley Road to Mike's house and knocked on the door, but he had not answered. They had noticed his truck was in the driveway with a, with a mower and trailer attached to it, just as the grandfather had seen it earlier that weekend as he passed by. The lawn had not been mowed, so I think my theory is that he arrived at his home and never had the opportunity to unload the mower from the trailer. He pulled into his driveway. He came upon something. Someone was either trying to break into his home or someone was there and maybe someone he knew, a neighbor or someone. Um, I don't know. It's very strange, but I don't believe that the trailer, that the lawnmower and the, was never, un, according to the grandfather, his father, the lawnmower was never unloaded. He had seen it there the, the day before. The the yard had not been mowed so
Around 8.30 the next day on Monday, their grandmother called the grandsons again and said that she had still not heard from Mike and she believed that something was very wrong. This raised the alarm bells in the family and the sons realized this time that something was actually going on. So they drove to his home in Maryville where he stayed three or four nights a week. Two of his vehicles, a Mercedes and a Harley-Davidson motorcycle, were still in the garage. His bed was made and the lights were off. The only vehicle that was not there was Mike's pickup truck, which Matt knew was at the farm. Something seemed out of place. After checking on the house, they met up and headed to the farm. Mike's mom had gone back to the farmhouse for a second time to see if he was there, and when she arrived, she called the sons and said the ATV was still in the front yard, Mike's truck was still parked by the house with the lawnmower and trailer still attached. When they arrived at the farm, they checked on the truck. Strangely, the windows were down, the doors were unlocked, his keys, ID, money clip, and cell phone were still in the vehicle. Well, this story goes on for a while, different scenarios and and theories. It's possible that this man, it, I, it doesn't make any sense. Anything, anything that I think about that I come up with a theory, it just doesn't make any sense that he arrived at the property, left his truck sitting in the driveway with the mower and the, and the trailer still attached, got on the four-wheeler and drove away. Did someone or was someone there waiting for him when he got there and you know someone he knew and asked for help or something and that's the reason why he just left everything and, and went. There's so many different things you can imagine and think about that could have happened to this man but um, the one that I have ruled out in my own mind is that he ran off because I don't believe that. Um, he had means. He owned a business. He owned two homes. He had two sons that he was close to. He had no family problems. He had no relationship problems. No one had ever said anything about him having any kind of business problems with, or personal problems with anybody. Um, he was successful. He, he wasn't struggling with his business. He No one had said anything about him coming like he had been depressed or suffering from any kind of health problems. So a scenario where someone would just up and disappear uh, purposely doesn't make any sense here. This man would have cashed out some... Um, he would have liquidated some things so that he would have money to do that. And no one said that there was ever any money missing or anything. So that's ruled out. I don't think he just intended to just disappear. Whatever happened to him, um, possibly one day they will find his remains someplace near the property. Most people who are going to go on a hike or going to go on a four-wheeler ride will at the very least roll their truck windows up and lock their doors. And it was as though he just planned to come right back and didn't make it back. So something very bizarre here. And I, I don't, that's really all I can say to wrap this video up. His sons have had him declared legally dead. And um, they just, they know in their hearts that he's not coming back. Um, and they've had to go on with their lives, but this is something that they will, just like all of us reading and hearing about these stories, we imagine what may have happened, but you have to imagine how they feel looking at it from the viewpoint of, that was my dad, and he was here an hour ago, and now he's gone. And, um there's really not much else to say about this. He just disappeared. It's just like he vanished. One minute his neighbors saw him on the four-wheeler and the next minute he's gone and no one ever sees him again.
Thanks for watching, everybody.